everyone, this is Tim Jeanette, the Metal Meeple, and in this video, we're taking a look at a game called Warehouse 51. Came out in 2015 by Funforge and Passport Games. It's designed by Bruno Faiduti, uh, Sergio Halaban, and Andre Zetz. It's for three to five players, though the box does say two players. That uh, was a print uh, typo in the printing on the first printing. Uh, it takes between 30 and 45 minutes, depending on the players. And basically, it's in the future, uh, America has ran out of money and they're trying to get out of debt or whatever. So all the, they're selling off all the relics of the world. All these billionaires come there and they're trying to spend money to buy these relics and to, to get the most points to win. But let's take a look at the game. I'll show you how it plays. We'll come back and I'll tell you what I think. So here we have Warehouse 51. Each player is going to receive a player board, which has all the layouts of the decks and everything and what the scoring is at the end. You also get 10 bars of gold that you use throughout the game for bidding purposes. And the game's a bidding game. You're going to be bidding on these cards in the middle of the table. One player is going to flip one over and bid. Um, on top of that, you have these counterfeit cards, which we're going to come into or come back to in a minute. But here's what happens. Like I said, each player gets 10 gold. And the idea is you want to collect um, the most valuable cards of each set. That way you have the majority by the end of the game. So in each deck, you have all these different relics. I apologize about my sleeves being, or cards being sleeved. They're going to be worth a value up at the top left. So two, three, and one, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the game, if you have the most points in blue, you're going to get the gold medal of eight points or silver if you're second place. Ties go um, and go to the lowest rank. Uh, so tied for first you get six, tied for second you get nothing. As you see, each deck is slowly digressing in the amount of cards. You've got eight, seven, six, and five different layouts. And at the end of the game are different points for the different categories of colors as well. At the end of the game, if you have one of each color, you receive five points in addition to all this. And for every five gold that you have, you get one more point. That's pretty much the scoring. So what's going to happen during the turn? One player, whose turn it is, is going to choose one of the four decks, flip over the top card. In this case, we have a one-point Baba Yaga's Mortar. Uh, they have different abilities. At the top right, they either have an X, which you can barely see there. Anyway, you have an X that means it's a, a curse. If it's a curse, it has a black background to the ability text. If it is a blessing, you have a white background and a star. The blessing are good effects, the curses are bad effects, but again, you need as many cards you want or can from a category to win it. So, in this case, we flip this over. We'll come back to the abilities, but let's say it's a one point blue card. Everybody's going to bid, starting with the player to the left of the person who flipped the card. So, that player says a number two, then three, four, whatever. If you pass, you're out. And once it gets all players passed but one, that player is going to pay that money to the person on their left. So anytime somebody wins an auction, the player is going to give their money to the player on their left-hand side. So after that, that player is going to take that card and put it face up in their tableau in front of them. So all players can see what you have. The next player is going to go and say he flips over a blue card again. And now we have a fist up here. The fist is essentially a closed bid auction in which all players are going to take their money uh, in one hand put whatever they want to bid in the other hand, put all their fists down on the table and reveal at the same time, throwing their money all over the place. So in this case, this player bids two gold. Whoever gets the most wins, ties go to the player that's closest to the player whose turn it is, or if it's that player, he gets it. And again, he's going to pay that money to the player on his left, and then that player is going to take the card uh, and put this into his um, tableau as well. Now there's four different types of abilities that can happen. <clears throat> There are immediate actions. In this case, it's a cur uh, curse, but there are blessed immediate actions. There's both uh, curse and blessed of each. This immediate action, you must discard another relic card of your choice from your own collection. Relics or any of these cards. Uh, there's permanent effects. These can be swapped around, and if they get swapped around, they don't happen again. It only happens whenever it gets goes into somebody from the middle of the table, not if they collect it from another player. Anyway, permanents, these will happen at all times. If you pawn the grail, take 10 ignits instead of 5, but you have to pay 15. We'll come back to what that means in a minute. Then you have 
end of game abilities, which in this case, it's going to allow you to change a counterfeit. Uh, we'll come back to that again. And scoring, which happens at the very end. This one is if you end up, don't end up scoring first or second place for this category, you lose three points. So there's a lot of different interesting effects. Some of them do not have effects, but you're going to go until all these cards have been auctioned off. And then at the end of that, you move on to the end of game where all the end of game abilities happen, uh, including the counterfeit cards. During setup, you're going to shuffle this deck of counter setup, or counterfeit cards. I chose to hold this off to last just because it makes more sense to explain the game. But each card in this deck represents every card in these decks. So there are some promos. If you put a promo in, you remove, like say you put a three pro promo red in, you remove the three promo red and put its counterfeit in, or counterfeit in here. Anyway, the reason that's important is because a lot of people got the promos and didn't know what to do with them, uh, but that's how that works. So the counterfeit cards are shuffled and in a two player game, you put two next to each player or in between each player, sorry. In a four or five player game, you only put one. Well, what this does is at the beginning of the game, the player, or if you're this player, you get to look at the cards on your left and the cards on your right. So in this case, you know that the two green shirts of Nessus is a counterfeit. And you know that the two Excalibur is a counterfeit, which was one of the cards that this player actually got. So he probably wouldn't have purchased that. He might have tried to upbid other people and let them have it. He also knows that these cards are in the game that are counterfeit. And what that does is during the end of game, before scoring, everybody reveals the counterfeit cards. And these cards will remove from the game any cards that the players have. So in this case, this Excalibur, well, it was counterfeit. So it gets removed from the game. After that, you do scoring by adding up however many points in whatever color you have. So say you had six points in blue and then somebody else had five and everybody else had less. The six point would get eight, five point would get six. You do that for each category. Like I said, you get five points for having a set and one point for every uh, gold. Now, if you're ever below $5 or five gold, you can pawn relics. You keep the relic, but you put a pawn token on it and you get five gold bars from the bank. If you pawn a relic, then it's good abilities, if it had any, such as, let's say this one right here, the Holy Grail. If you pawn the Holy Grail, it loses this text. However, if it is a cursed card, it does not lose its text. So in this case, you can no longer pawn relics to the pawn broker. That is very bad. But, so if it has black text, you um, keep it if it's pawned. If it's white text, you do not keep it until you buy it back. So at the end of the game, you have a final chance of buying your relics back at double the cost. So you got $5 for pawning it. You have to pay 10 to get it back. Depending on how the game goes, you might choose not to do that. And if so, you lose that card for scoring purposes. Lastly, there are two cards in the game. I think there's another one, but two for these, these things here. They come out and they will give you a certificate of authenticity, in which case you get to place that on one of your relics such as, say you had that card and you had the Excalibur, which is fake in this game, or in this specific example, you can put this certificate and it makes it real, no matter that you flipped over the Excalibur counterfeit at the end of the game. There are some other cards that allow you to do that. Even if the Excalibur ends up being, or I'm sorry, even if the card that gave it ends up being a counterfeit, you still get that, so they're very valuable. And pretty much whoever has the most points at that point is the winner. So there you go, that's Warehouse 51. This is a pretty interesting game for me. I think that um, the bidding was a little bit, not the bidding, but the paying out and stuff was a little bit different. Uh, different enough to where it took a couple of games to get used to. Because paying the person on their left is a very odd thing, I think. And But it works, you know. We'll come back to that. But essentially, you pay the person to your left, and then they're going to start the next auction. But they're not starting the auction. They're going to have the person to the left start the auction. So you're giving them money so that when it goes around and it gets back to them, they have a lot of money to buy that next item if they wanted to or whatever. It's just really interesting because I haven't really seen any other game do that. There probably is, but obviously I haven't played every bidding game in the world. Uh, comment below if you see that or if you know one. But anyway, so it's a pretty interesting game. I think the problem with it though is that it doesn't provide a good experience for five players, at least in our book. Three to four, awesome. Three players essentially is great. Four players is good too. Five players, the problem I think is that one person's really going to get shut down 
uh, because that it's kind of like a weird waterfall effect. This guy gets money, then he's going to give the next guy money. He's going to give the next guy money. But in a five-player game, somebody just doesn't get it trickling down to them fast enough, and it seems to not be a good experience for one player. That's part of the strategy, maybe, but I just find it more enjoyable with three and four players. Um, one thing I really do like about the game is the curses, because <laughs> you want every card that you can you know, obviously, well, maybe not, you know, but if you're going for blue and then somebody else is going for blue and there's like one card left, but it has a curse. Sometimes you got to take that curse. It may not be the last card in the game. So you're like, ah, I really don't want that curse because maybe now I can't pawn items and get more money if I run out of money, but do I really need yellow cards? And that's all that's left. So it's pretty interesting. Some of them are really, really cool to, you know, cause you're like, ah, oh, man, I really want to bid on that, but it has a curse. And then on top of that, it might be counterfeit. So it's giving me a curse and at the end of the game, it's not going to score me any points. That right there is amazing. And I like the fact that, you know, you get to see uh, a lot of cards in a lower player game on those counterfeits, but there's still a lot of cards. It's just really cool because you're kind of like, oh, he bid really high on that, but he really doesn't need it. Is he trying to outbid other players just to get it to not have them score the most points? Or does he know that's a counterfeit and he's trying to work up everyone else to pay money? But you got to be careful on who you're trying to get to buy it because that money may not go to you. It might go to somewhere else. Really interesting mechanisms there. I, I really like this game a lot. I just don't find it enjoyable with five players. Your mileage may vary. Anyway, so definitely check this one out. I think it's a really quick card game um, that you know, anybody can have in their collection. It's really easy to teach. Um, and it's just fast and fun. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me at timjanets at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram at the link below or my tag below. And until next time, keep on rocking, rolling dice. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top rated audio podcast at dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. <laughs>